Well, thanks, Adam. Uh, good morning, folks. So I'm here today to talk about the Open Data Cube and some of the work that we've do been doing at Frontier Side to make it easier to use. So I'll start off by answering a question. What is the Open Data Cube? So we have a long definition which comes off the website, and I'll read that out here. So the objective of the Open Data Cube is to increase the impact of satellite data by providing an open and freely accessible exploitation tool and to foster a community to develop, sustain, and grow the breadth and depth of applications. My nutshell explanation of what the Open Data Cube is, I guess from a technical perspective, is that it's an open source Python library that facilitates working with large volumes of raster data. So which data does it facilitate working with? Well, Earth observation data. And um, Radiant Earth have a nice graph here showing the number of satellites that have been launched to capture Earth observation data. Now, last year, there were twice as many launched as the previous year, and there was pretty much the, the twice as many launched as the year before that. And it's probably fairly likely that there's going to be an enormous number of satellites launched this year and next year. The point is that there is a... Uh, well, it looks like one of those exponents, you know. It's, it's a trend that's going up. It's getting easier and easier. So there's going to be, there's a lot of data pouring down from space now, and there's going to be a lot more. Um, what that means is we've got um, more data. We need to be able to access it easier. And there's a lot of different ways that it's getting easier to access that data. One of the things that makes it easier is an emerging paradigm, which is storing data in an object store like uh, Amazon's S3 or equivalents in the Google Cloud or the Alibaba Cloud. Uh, there's a part of the HTTP protocol called the get range request, which allows you to ask for a file off a web server and just ask for part of that file. So you don't have to download the whole thing. And so some clever people uh, extended GeoTIFF in a backwards compatible way to add uh, a little bit more to the headers uh, and to structure the data in internally so that you can go and access just the parts of uh, GeoTIFF that you want while it stays there stored up on the cloud. As we all know, the cloud means that all that complexity becomes somebody else's problem, which as someone that implements technical systems is really nice when you can offload some of that. So, Cogs are a great way to store enormous volumes of data somewhere, which means that I don't have to manage it, someone else is managing it, and I can go and access it. So, how can we use Cogs? Well, QGIS 3 comes with support out of the box. So you can go to S3 and go to somewhere like Digital Earth Australia's uh, data store and have a look at all of their TIFFs and find where their TIFFs, copy the link, you can paste it into QGIS and you can start using it. Other people uh, for example, we spoke to a fellow from Queensland and he stores a 600 gigabyte GeoTIFF on S3 and just browses it, streams it off the net into QGIS. So it's a way of storing very large bits of data and just accessing it. Some good news for us is that COGS are supported natively in the Open Data Cube. Very convenient. So, back to the question, what is the Open Data Cube? Well, a little bit of history. Uh, a long time ago, uh, Landsat satellites were launched and they didn't have a lot of onboard storage, so they used to dump data down wherever it was convenient. One of the convenient spots on the other side of the world from the US is in Woomera where there's an antenna or a satellite dish, whatever you call it. And so Australia is a, a downlink station for a bunch of data. That got sent over to Canberra somehow, that got sent back to the US somehow, and in Canberra other folks uh, put it onto tapes and stored it in some kind of deep final repository. There was a project um, in the less distant past called Unlocking the Landsat Archive, where these tapes were digitised and the data was stored on an NCI, on a supercomputer. And as part of that project, there was a bit of software written called the Australian Geoscience uh, Data Cube, which was used to be able to make that data more easy to access. At one point, that was rewritten to make it not only work with uh, Landsat data and work with other data sources and to work with other projections other than, I think, our Australian Albers, which was the one that was used for that. And it was called the AGDC version 2, very creative. Soon after that, it was renamed to the Open Data Cube, and that's where we're at now. So it's a software library that enables access to vast quantities of raster data. Technically, it comes in a few components. We have the Open Data Cube Python library itself, uh, there's a Postgres database which contains an index pointing at actual data, whether that's on a file system that's something that you can access or one of these object stores. Uh, it's up to you. After that, 
you build applications on top of that, whether that's a data science kind of application like Jupyter Notebook where you're exploring the data, uh, some spatial web services, so GS Science Australia's Digital Earth Australia folks build a WMS system on top of uh, the Open Data Cube, um, serving data directly out of S3 um, uh, into things like the national map, or whatever you want, it's a Python library, you can do whatever you want, you can build your own bespoke tool in it. So that's what it is. Now, how can we use it? Well, we've been doing a little bit of work at Frontier SI to make it, um, I don't know, just to sort of illustrate how you can implement and how you can use it. So one of the ways that we've put together is a thing that we're, called, we're calling the Sandbox. And we have a test environment there, uh, which we've launched uh, for Australian data. And we also have another one testing, which we've launched on a global data set uh, using Jupyter Hub, which enables a multi-user environment for Jupyter. We've indexed data off S3, which means the people like myself and Felix over there who maintain the system don't have to wrangle uh, terabytes and terabytes of data. Somebody else does that. Somebody like Andrew over here. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> and it means that um, people can turn up on a website, log into this system, and start exploring geoscience uh, um, satellite imagery and vast quantities of satellite imagery um, very easily. We've also put together a thing called the Cube in a Box, the title of this talk, which is a Docker, Docker Compose workspace. It's up on GitHub. You can download the code, uh, and if you've got Docker and Docker Compose installed, in about five minutes, you can launch yourself your own little open data cube environment, including uh, indexing data off um, a Landsat 8 uh, global archive. Uh, you can actually in include a bounding box and index any data from anywhere in the world um, and be up and running and exploring that data um, really easily. Uh, we also have a template for CloudFormation, so you can click a button if you've got an AWS account, uh, uh, AWS account and launch uh, your own Open Data Cube up on AWS. Again, from clicking the button, launching, deploying an EC2 instance, indexing data, giving yourself an environment takes around seven minutes. Uh, this here is an example of how long it takes to launch the Open Data Cube. Um, the kind of point of all of this is to get the learning curve of the Open Data Cube, which is fairly high, and try and make it shallow so that you can get up and running and started with an environment without having to understand everything. The Cube in a Box is an infrastructure as code project, which means that all of the code that's required to get this magic happening is there inside the box, and so. Maybe it's a black box, but you can open up and have a look and start learning and reading the scripts that are used to get it all working. As I said, up in the cloud, doesn't take that long, and you can get yourself uh, a scalable environment that um, gives you access to all the data. So now, what can we do with the Open Data Cube after that? Well, there's some simple case studies like uh, a mining example. And so this is a real example of uh, data from Digital Earth Australia. Um, and here we have a mine site, and what we're doing is we've got an area on the right-hand side which is a mine site being rehabilitated, and on the left side we've got uh, an area of uh, native vegetation, and we can quickly investigate that area and do a trend over time and have a look at how uh, things like um, bare earth is changing. So this is, this is out of a, a data set called Fractional Cover, which is a classification of pixels into various classes. So in this case, the mine site uh, up the top of the, is the blue line, and so there's a small bare earth there, and over time, it's getting closer to the orange line, which is the, uh, the forested area. And so what we're showing there in that graph is that the mine site actually is being rehabilitated. There's less bare earth, so it's being revegetated. And so we can use something like that to monitor um, a mining company's obligations in terms of um, rectifying a site. Uh, the other example is um, WMS, and so this is an example of uh, the national map uh, visualization using the data cube, and you can access this uh, across the entirety of Australia right now. Um, another sort of advantage of the cube in a box environment is something called the developer experience. You've heard of user experience, I guess, you know, like focusing on the user and making sure that um, they find an application easy. Well, there's this um, idea of developer experience, which as a developer and implementer myself, I'm 
pretty interested in. And, and I think that's an important opportunity for us at Frontier SI to, um, to, to put forward for the community is, is uh, building tools that illustrate how to use the Open Data Cube, how to implement the Open Data Cube, and to increase, uh, to, to increase um, or make improve the developer experience. So we've got code examples and these infrastructure examples that demonstrate how to use the Open Data Cube to try and, again, make that learning curve a little shallower. So, in terms of outcomes, I think that we've shallowed, uh, we've flattened the learning curve a little bit. We've got infrastructure as code which documents the architecture. We've got environment where users can worry about um, using and not deploying this infrastructure. Our developers and implementers can open up that black box and really explore inside how the, we've done it so that they can do it themselves. And it means that testing and evaluation is easy. Docker's great, you know, there, there might be a bug in a point release of a of a, a library that's used by the Open Data Cube, and we can install that specific one into Docker and test that environment, and then blow it away, install a different point release, and see how they work. And it's it's a really good opportunity. And in conclusion, Cogs make the data easy. The Open Data Cube makes accessing that data easy. The Cube in a Box makes the Open Data Cube easy, and you can come and join us on Slack or on GitHub. Thank you very much for your time. Paul. Uh, you mentioned um, indexing the world. Is that out of the USGS level one public data set? Yes, awesome. it is. <laughs> I'm quite interested to look at indexing Sentinel because I'm, I'm not quite 100% sure, but I think that we can do range requests on the JPEG 2000s that uh, Synergize has. That's something we want to evaluate because level one data is a little problematic. I've uh, got a couple of questions. First one is, how easy is it to use for your own data? So if you've got your own sort of project and you want to use it um, yeah, with the data cube. The second one is, um, how many dimensions do you support? And do you support um, REST attribute tables? Um, good questions. The first one is reasonably easy. So um, you need to get a, a product definition and then uh, get a little bit of metadata around it, each of the files and, and then do the index into the database. And then you can use the Open Data Cube API to be uh, querying. For your second question, i probably not the best to answer that. Can you, can you restate your second question? Or Andrew, are you? Oh, well, I mean, the, the cube sort of suggests that you've got, you know, talking about satellite imagery, yeah. you've got 2D, and then you've got probably the third dimension is time, so you've got time series. And um, could I have um, sort of like a cube which has voxels, so sort of volumetric data, um, sort of across time, or you, you know, you could have a four dimensional, five, dim five dimensional data, so easily, so having more uh, so attributes sitting in, in, in that rest of data, basically. So it's, it's set up so that it can be extended for that, but we haven't got any satellite data to do that so far. So, mm -hmm. um, so as far as I'm saying, you're using GDA and other right? Yeah, that's right. So how, I mean, since GDA is essentially two-dimensional, right? So how would that work if, um, so all the API is based on, on 2D? So the API is based on 2D uh, at the lowest level, but then stacking that 2D in any number of dimensions. Um, if you've got higher dimensional data um, in a single file, you can write another type of driver that doesn't use GDL but uses HDF or some other thing. And load that data in. That would require a little bit of tweaking in the code, but um, that, that's something you want to move towards. So you go from just satellite data to the other data you want. Mm. But also, don't be deceived by the name. It's not a data cube. It's data cubes. So, um, uh, so, so, like, essentially, you have um, as many uh, bands as you like in there, and um, but they're all individual cubes on their own, and and they all fit together. And so you can it's an interesting it. discussion about where the cube sits. Is it is it the data that's on the server that's the cube, or is it when you load it into memory and start working with it? Is that the cube, or is it the whole system itself, uh, you know, a data cube? But, um, somewhere in the middle of all of that, we've got <laughs> cubes of data that we're working yeah. with. Attribute tables, it's got a lot of support for metadata, and before any metadata you put into it is uh, completely uh, like searchable. You can, uh, 
pretty much Jason did it. Large tables or millions of records? Uh, yeah, like uh, it, it, it supports a lot of metadata. I think that, that's probably the advantage of it yeah. uh, to other other systems. Yeah, I've seen. It I mean, it's, and it's quite the library. So we're, we're, we're working with some of the other tools like Dask and other distri distributed computing environments. So there's, there's plausibility of getting it to the scale in really big ways too. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jeff. Uh, question from JT. Uh, how does the OpenWQ handle uh, very large amounts of data? Uh, and as a side question, is it a platform for long term servicing of data? Or is it more for short term uh, efforts? Um, well, I think it's, it's a platform for long term servicing of data. It's certainly around making. Uh, you know, abstracting access in the raw data and, and putting it in behind an API, which makes it easier. Um, in terms of large volumes of data, again, um, you know, working with big volumes, you've still got to slice and dice and batch it up and send it off to, to processes. So you can use Open Data Cube as your own pipeline for doing that. There's the, the Dask um, uh, library for Python, which I think is a really interesting way of exploring doing that. And um, uh, it certainly is used. Um, Operationally, in a sort of hardcore way, with, in Geoscience Australia and CSIRO, um, uh, and a couple of other organisations around the world too. Yeah. Okay.